looking back on the time where I, um, you know, decided to take a break away from uh, from cricket was, I think, a culmination of quite a lot of, you know, different things that happened, you know, over a prolonged period of time. You know, having to spend a lot of time away from home with uh, living under the conditions throughout the, you know, the COVID times, which obviously affected, you know, the whole world and, and the whole nation, you know, and then the illness of my father um, and then eventually the passing of my father. It just sort of, it, it, the relationship with myself and cricket just sort of took a, um, it just sort of, yeah, just took a bad turn, I think. Um, and I was finding myself actually sort of resenting every time that I was either training or out on the field and sort of all just became a bit too much. And, you know, it's, it was one of those things where I was feeling a certain way when I was by myself, but then having to put on a, another sort of face when I was in the dressing room or, you know, around the other lads or around other people and stuff like that. So having to sort of continuously be, you know, a different version of myself um, over a long period of time, um, you know, obviously just got a bit too much for me and then adding that to, um, to all the things that sort of I had to go through over, a, you know, a, a long period of time just got a bit too much. What did that break from the game give you? I think it gave me a, an opportunity to, to go away and, um, first of all, speak to someone um, about, you know, my, my feelings, not just about um, feelings about cricket, just feelings in general, um, how, what I was going through at the time and got a, uh, an understanding about what sort of emotions I was going through and how that was affecting, you know, me, my, my family and my friends and the people around me as well. And it just also gave me a time to just completely get away from cricket and how, you know, I sort of had to, to live my life for such a long period of time, which unfortunately I wasn't enjoying when I had to take a break. So, yeah, you know, going away and just not having to... and just sort of living a, a life where I was just sort of waking up and not having to worry about all that other kind of stuff and just spend some time at home and, and getting myself back into a place and a position where I felt that you know, I was able to go back and play cricket again. At what point did you realise that you were ready to come back? The person I was speaking to actually said, he said it will be like a, um, there'll be something that, that will bring you back, you know, no one knows what it will be, you probably won't know what it will be, but it will just hit you. And it was actually when I had my, um, my mm. second surgery on my finger, when I could actually move it again, because when I came back to play after my first surgery, I was actually not able to move it at all, and it was very painful, and. Um, it was frustrating not being able to, to sort of be able to go out and perform to how I wanted to do when I knew that my finger was not allowing me to do that. So yeah, when I remember being on the operating table and the surgeon actually said, oh look, your, your joint's actually moving again. And I remember leaving the hospital after my surgery and I was like, that was my moment where I was, you know, I felt that once I get all my rehab done and get back get back into it again, I'm pretty certain I'm going to be able to, to go back on the field again. There's um, a quote from you I saw when you were coming back and said you were just looking forward to being back with your mates. How sort of instrumental mm. were those mates in that time away and bringing you back in? If you build relationships with people um, that go beyond a working relationship, and, you know, I had a lot of guys in the dressing room when I came back in who I've been playing cricket with since, you know, the teenage years and built very good relationships with them away from cricket as well, who, who aren't just work colleagues, are also very good friends of mine. So, you know, always, you know, staying in contact with them whilst I wasn't playing to then um, getting back into the dressing room and being around everyone was, um, yeah, I remember being very excited when uh, I met up at the airport before we flew to Australia and got to see everyone again. You've talked a lot about your dad and what an influence he was on your career, but also on, on your life as well. Was, was there a sort of an element of doing it for your dad coming back? One of the reasons why I was, you know, almost pushing myself to, to still be out on the field was actually um, because it was sort of like, oh, this is what, you know, this is what my dad has um, always wanted. You know, he, he, he loved watching me play all over the world for various different teams or whether it be England or in the IPL or, or whoever it was. Um, so that was something that I used to, to stay out on the field through that. Whereas, you know, looking back on it, actually, it was that was another thing that made me resent it because it was sort of associating cricket with um, 
you know, my, my dad passing away. So it was a real, real strange one to think about. Whereas, you know, now it's just sort of every time I go out in the field, you know, even though he's not here, I know that he is here and, you know, I'm always thinking of him, um, always trying to take him out on the field with me as well. And, and rather than use my dad as a reason to, to keep playing, you know, it's just nice knowing that even though he's not here, I've still got him here. You talk about taking him out on the field. How, how do, uh, there's obviously the celebration that you've got for him. How else does that sort of manifest itself? Uh, I think just naturally, really. I think, you know, there's many cricketers, many sportsmen around the world who do something in, in memory of somebody. Um, so I'm not the only one who has something like that. But, um, yeah, it's nice when, when something goes well individually that you sort of uh, just sort of pay a, bit, a little bit of respect to him up there. Let's move on to um, you taking the captaincy. Can you just talk us through how that came about? Yeah, Ruti, Ruti called me before anything got officially announced out in the public, just to let me know that he was stepping down from, um, from his role as captain. Um, and to be honest, like, I just sort of let him speak. And at that time, I was you know, just a listener for him, because obviously it was, must have been a very tough decision to step down from you know, one of the greatest honours to lead your country out into a sporting field. But he was you know, the, an unbelievable you know, servant to the job. What he had to do for you know, nearly 18 months or two years of captaining aside through COVID was you know, unbelievable. You know, we, I'll always look back on, that, on, on Joe's you know, captaincy for that period as him holding the fort. And, you know, I was very fortunate enough that when I uh, got the opportunity to captain that I wasn't, um, you know, the, the person bearing that. Um, so Joe did a magnificent job as his role as England captain um, and sort of paved the way for me to come in and, and take over. And, yeah, I just remember that it was one of those things where I, I phoned Keezy because he was new into the job as well. Um, I just phoned him just to let him know that. Um, if the opportunity is there for me, then I'm absolutely ready for it. Rather than him sort of double-guessing himself whether I actually wanted to do it. And then, yeah, we, we, he, he drove off and met me in, in the North East up at Durham at Seam Hall and we had a good conversation and just sort of progressed from there. At what point did you start to think, as England captain, this is how I want my team to play? I think when you get the responsibility to do it, you put your mark on the job and put your mark onto a, onto a team in terms of how you know you want to go and play and and you know bring people in and doing that and then obviously when uh, Brendan McCullum's name came up in the conversations around new coach I was very excited to initially be thinking about having the opportunity to work alongside him as captain him as coach and then when it officially got announced it was just very simple and spoke about how we sort of both see English test cricket going forward and we were very aligned with that. You know, it wasn't like the case of an hour and a half conversation um, about what we want to do. It was, it was pretty simple and um, the messages, you know, sort of from the outset have, have been that towards the team. So, yeah, I think early on I was very, um, very clear about how I wanted to sort of have an input into, into test cricket and how I thought we could maybe change the way in which we think about test cricket. If you would des could describe your approach, your collective approach with Brendan to test cricket, how would you describe it? Uh, very early on in the summer, I tried to describe to the lads that, you know, feel as if you're in the, um, you're in the entertainment business. You know, go out and entertain the people who, who come to watch us live at the grounds, who, who watch us at home on TV and people around the world and try to make you know, every day of the test matches as entertaining and as sort of watchful as we possibly can. Try to sort of take the, not the result out of it, but, you know, just enjoy the moment of what we're trying to do. We're out there representing our country with, you know, the three lions on our chest, you know, and just, I don't know, it's explaining to go out and have, have some fun, you know, because if, if you can't enjoy playing, you know, test match cricket, um, representing your country, then, um, you know, what, what else is, is there to do, really? Not adding any more pressures to, to what the game already brings with it. Going out and playing for England is extreme. It comes with it enough pressures as it is, and, and trying to take a, all of the external pressures away from that that can sometimes be added to to individual players is something that we really tried to do early on. And I think in in the way in which we delivered, in which we spoke to the team, I think we managed to do that really well. And I think that showed in the way in, in the response that um, me and Brenda managed to get from the players that. You know, we went out there and everyone tried to express themselves as well as they possibly could and, and just tried to, 
to look at it from a just from an exciting point of view and yeah just try and enjoy it as much as possibly can did the players take a bit of convincing it's a very different brand of cricket very different to what anyone else plays what's been played before did did not looking for names but did some of the team take a bit of convincing to come along with you on the journey uh, no I don't think so I don't think you know it took too many people to be to be convinced by it all I think what obviously does help is that when you have some you know very good success such early on um, with the new way of going out and playing that it obviously helps to to that and it gives people confidence and knowing that you know this completely different way of playing you know can work you know as it was so different it was just I think the, the guys just really enjoyed actually playing around with and experimenting about a different way that they've probably become accustomed to of, of how to play test cricket um, and I think you know, it showed, you know, Jimmy Anderson was actually smiling on the cricket pitch for a change. So, um, you know, I count that as a win um, anyway. So, But no, I, ju I just think that the lads just really enjoyed the, the sort of freedom that everybody got given to go out and just really express their abilities and their skills that, you know, they have. Um, you know, because to get picked for England, you obviously have to be a very high skilled player. Um, but then, I guess, being given the the freedom and the, and the backing of the dressing room to go out and you know really express yourself and then not have to worry about the next game coming because you know we back if you get picked you're going to get backed for, for a good period of time you know it's not a case of if you if you don't perform within two or three games we're going to look elsewhere because that's something we really try to do is to be consistent with selections and also consistent with our messaging as well one of your first calls was to bring back broad and anderson who hadn't been at the caribbean was there any questions to whether you'd do that? That's the first, it's the first thing I said to Rob Key when we met was Anderson and Broader back. Pretty much how simply that went. Talk me through going into your first test as permanent England captain, uh, the New Zealand test. And in goes Stokes. Is there any bowls on the leg stump? And it's flicked away to the leg side. He's caught a mid-wicket by Pope. And New Zealand are all out for 132. And they're bowled out in 40 overs. Yeah, well, we got off to a great start. Obviously, the first day, you know, bowling first. I think I can't remember exactly what we bowled them out for, but I remember it was we just kept on taking wickets over and over again. So couldn't got off to a better start. And then with the bat, we we didn't get the runs that we wanted. A bolt, bowls to edge, corner slip. England are all out. 141 all out, and New Zealand have polished England off. England do have a small lead. I believe it was, you say, a small lead, having bowled uh, New Zealand out for 1-3-2. I must admit, I thought I'd be saying, oh, well, England have cruised nicely to sort of 280-300, but I should have known better. And uh, another disappointing display with the bat from England. I think Baz's first, first words were, well, we said we were going to be entertaining, so what's not entertaining about that, you know, getting rolled out for 150? But, you know, at the same time, it was like it sets up a great test match. You know, it's... We're still on level playing fields here. New Zealand have got to bat again, and then hopefully we'll go down and chase it down. And that's literally how the game played out. Um, you know, it was great to get off to, to, to a winning start against a very strong team. Obviously, New Zealand won the um, Test Championship as well. So, yeah, I just remember being that, that first game, very special to, to lead England out officially for the first time um, at Lords and, and against New Zealand as well. You, you mentioned it. It must have meant a lot to you that you have got that winning start for that new, this new brand of cricket that you want to play. Yeah, I think it was more important for the team rather than myself and, and Baz, you know, because we're very, you know, regardless of how those sort of early games went, you know, it was something that um, we were very clear and, and we're going to stay true to about this. If it doesn't work, you know, that doesn't mean we go away to the drawing board and we start again. You know, we've before we've even bowled a ball together as captain and coach, we've set out how we want to go about things and we've been very clear with the boys about that, of how we want to go and approach Test Match Cricket. So even if it hadn't have gone to plan, you, you would have seen the same thing throughout the summer. Yeah, it obviously does help when, when you win uh, the majority of your games when you start out. So I want to go to <coughs> day five at Trent Bridge. Free entry for people, a full house coming to see this attacking, attractive brand of cricket. Can you talk me through that day as well, particularly that partnership with Johnny Bairstow in the middle? And England are just one strike away from winning this match. And there's still 22 overs available to be bowled. And at T, 
I'll be honest, I thought that was probably a draw. But I think a few times throughout the summer it was great that the, the grounds were allowing, you know, uh, free entry, especially into the, you know, going into the last days and stuff like that. So um, it was amazing having full house at Trent Bridge for them to be able to, to witness what they got to witness there. It was just, it was amazing. And for not one second did we ever not think that we were going to go and try and chase us down. Um, remember Marcus Truscothic, sort of new into the job, he actually said to Brendan on the balcony, he said, so at any point in this chase are we going to consider blocking out for the draw? And Baz just laughed at him and went like, nah. To have that, you know, clarity from your coach and just, I guess it just filters down to, you know, the, the specialist coaches, you know, your batting coach, bowling coach, fielding coach, and then it also filters down towards the, you know, to the players, senior players, the, the, the not so senior players, just to really give them completeness and clarity about what we want to achieve. Um, so yeah, on day five, all we had in our mind was, was we're going to, we're going to try and chase this down. Um, if we are going to lose this game, we're going to lose it because we tried to chase it down. Um, because I think, you know, that's that's what the crowd wants to see. They want to see a team go for go for the win. Um, and you know, if we were to lose trying to do that, at least we could say we gave ourselves a crack at doing what we wanted to do and what we set out to do at the very start of the summer, um, which was to 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 win games. And I think if you're prepared to lose games by giving yourself an opportunity to win it, then if you lose the odd couple here and there, then that's absolutely fine. In comes Bolt, and Bowles to Stokes, and there it is. <laughs> Clubbed away through the offside, and Stokes stands there, back raised, left arm raised. Scenes of Headingley 2019, I have to say, he hit that in the same sort of a place. And this full house, is Absolutely on its feet, jumping up and down, shouting and chanting and applauding. An exhilarating afternoon of cricket. England win by five wickets, set up by Johnny Bairstow, and that furious assault after tea. But up there on the England dressing rung seat, lots of man hugs going on, handshakes, and just general celebrations, and no doubt I'm sure saying, what have we just seen? There was a moment during that final day at Trent Bridge where Johnny Bairstow just cleared the boundary and hit a six. You were batting with him. Can you tell us what you said to him? Yeah, I remember at one point the New Zealand team went to one of our tactics of bowling short um, to, to almost, I don't know, not buy a wicket, but just to, to make it a little bit tougher, you know, because when you've got all the men out on, on the boundary, you've sort of, you're in two minds about whether you go up or down. And, Johnny actually said, he says, I don't know, what, what do you reckon I should do now with all these men back? And I just went, well, if the balls are short, why don't you just hit it over the head, hit it into the stand? And he literally just went, all right. And then he did it like five or six times. Bairstow's waiting, bat held high. Southie bowls to him. Oh, it's hit him down the ground. Here it comes, very high. And it's gone for six. <laughs> he just stood there and whacked it, basically. And Johnny Bairstow's not hanging around. When you know what we're trying to do, when you're trying to chase, chase the total down and then the team goes to something like that, you still have to score runs and, you know, just Johnny's got unbelievable power with the bat. You know, I've seen him play knocks like that in white ball cricket where he just hits the ball miles into the stand when he went ball short. And just because it's test cricket and you're in whites and you're playing against a red ball doesn't mean you have to play it any different. Um, but that knock was just remarkable to stand at the other end to watch, you know, it was just complete enough a domination of a seriously, seriously good bowling attack. South, the bowls to Besto, back cuts, there it is! Down towards the deep third boundary. Is it going to go for four? No, it's not back inside the rope. And Stokes has enough in him to come back for a third run, and Besto takes his helmet off, leaps in the air. That has been an astonishing innings from Johnny Besto. And what a day on which to do it as well, with England chasing nearly 300 on the final day. Everyone standing up in this Trent Bridge ground to salute him. One of the great days of his cricketing life. Not quite the fastest hundred, but it's been absolutely stunning hitting since T. 77 balls. T20 hitting in a test match. I don't think people will forget 
that run chase and that innings in particular because you know it was an amazing day and it was a really amazing day for Johnny you know one of the, one of the greats and what can you say about Johnny's summer because he seems to have been the one who has been most transformed by this new approach yeah I think I look at you know not just Johnny but if we're pointing Johnny out here I think you look at Johnny's white ball cricket and how successful he is you know he's one of the you know one of if not if not the best opening batters in the short format um, but he's very clear and he gets given bit, you know, a lot of clarity about how to go out and play because it's such a team-driven message. And we all know how good Johnny is and I just think giving Johnny that, um, you know, that freedom to go out and, and play in, in a very similar way in test cricket as he does in white ball cricket because he wants to dominate the bowling attack. And, you know, sometimes the narrative of test cricket is, no, you need to like, sit back and sit in and you know, see them into the third spells and stuff like that. But, now I think we're seeing a completely different side to a lot of our players because of the freedom that we've been, like they've been given to go out and do that. Even you know who thought Joe Root could be better than what he was, but you know you look at his summer as well. Some of the shots he's been playing and Bracewell in and uh, Root plays reverse. He gets hold of it, gets four for it to the left of point, all the way down to the boundary. Just remarkable, and it, it, I think for me as a captain, it's just so good to sit back and watch these lads go out and and play in the way in which they do, you know, just the, the domination that they've showed over some incredible bowling attacks, you know, you think New Zealand, um, India and South Africa, they're not, you know, I know bugs of the ball, they're a seriously good bowling attack, but yeah, I think it's, it's great to see it, you know, just sort of starting to hopefully filter down from us, down to, you know, the England Lions, England 19s, and then, you know, into county cricket, because, you know, it's, I think it shows that you don't have to be stuck in, in a particular way of playing test cricket just because it's been done for however long for you know a long period of time. It's yeah, it's different, but it's exciting to watch. India, let's go to the fourth innings. England's highest ever run chase. Jadeja over the wicket bowls. A root goes for the first sweep. They're going to go for it. It's a scuffed shot, but it doesn't matter. And England have recorded their highest ever score to win a test match, batting in the fourth innings, and they've done it with consummate ease, with ridiculous ease. Was there ever any doubt, um, you're going to say there's no doubt you're going to go for it, but was there ever any doubt that you wouldn't get it? Uh, yeah, so going into that fourth innings against uh, India, Edgebaston, obviously, you know, trying to chase down a pretty daunting total, it was never, again, never considered to, to not go for it. And again, it was the message, you know, if we're going to lose this game, we're going to lose it trying to, to win it. And I think if you look at, there's a lot of great things throughout that summer. But one of the most pleasing things for me was you're watching Zach and Alex's opening stand, you know, opening the batting in England's tough. You know, the ball does quite a lot more than as it gets older. And, you know, they found it tough at the top, you know, facing some unbelievable bowlers with a new ball. and you know, for those two to go out and play in the manner in which they did and, you know, not look after themselves, but they really set the, the benchmark for that chase. I think, you know, 100 run opening standing, like 19 overs or something like that was, was incredible. And then, you know, um, Ruti and, and Johnny doing what they did, you know, yet again for us in the summer was, was just amazing. But, no, there was never any doubt in our minds that we were going to, you know, try and chase down what India had set us. And yeah, the lads just sort of were on a roll at that point. South Africa at Lords was the first defeat you've had to being a points captain. And was there any moment where you doubted yourself, doubted your approach after that South Africa test? Uh, yeah, so that this test against South Africa at Lords, you know, was just a little blip. Um, you know, we what was it two and a half days? I think we lost the game, and obviously all the all the queries were out there getting asked after the game about this style and, and that style, you know, are you going to reconsider it? And it was just, it was like, no, like, absolutely not. Here is Janssen again. Anderson waits and then comes down the wicket and has bowled him. That's it. That's the end of the test match. South Africa have won by an innings and 12 runs. It has been a comprehensive shellacking of England here at Lords. Inside two days of full play. Here he is. Well, Ben. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a chastening defeat, isn't it? Well, it's a defeat, yeah. A quick one. Yeah, well, defeat's a defeat. Doesn't matter if it's three days or five days. Okay. How do you look back and analyse how England played in the game then? Uh, well, I just think we didn't play anywhere near the 
you know, capabilities that we know we're, we're able to go out and produce. Um, you know, no matter what side of cricket you play, if you don't play good cricket, you're going to lose. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to produce what we've been able to do in the first four games, and South Africa were just better than us on all three days, yeah. or two and a half, as you said. I remember, I remember saying, I think it might have been to Jonathan Agnew, and he was like, oh, it was quite a, um, you know, devastating loss, that. I was like, oh, yeah, it was like, yeah, but two and a half days. I was like, well, you don't get any points for losing in five days, so, you know, a loss is a loss. You know, whether you're losing two and a half or five, it doesn't really matter, but... Um, no, there was never any doubt about how we were going to keep continuing playing and, you know, if you, if you play to win, you might lose the odd game. But um, I remember being in the dressing room after, actually, and obviously the lads are a little bit down, as you are after a loss. And um, it's always, you know, it's never a nice feeling losing the game and stuff like that. It's, yeah, it's not nice, but I was saying to Baz, oh, I've got a few days off here, and so I remember, like, going around, should we get some golf sorted for the lads just to, to know, like, still feel relaxed and stuff and I remember going like first thing I said after that loss was right lads put your hand up if you want to play golf and I remember looking around and a few of the lads were like looking at each other like what like and it was like well it, me <laughs> like it was real like I'll never forget that like sort of looking around and seeing the sort of like not smiles come onto people's faces but the like relief I think that oh god what's going to happen here like we've been beaten like quite badly like what, what's going to be said and I think that again just sort of lifted another, you know, lifted the weight off a few people's shoulders of oh, what's going to happen here. And it's fine, like, we're going to lose games of cricket playing in the way which we play, but just because we've had a little blip on, on the way doesn't mean that we're going to stop trying to do what we set out to achieve. And then, yeah, next test bounced back pretty well. well and so, talk us through the rest of that series again, vindication for your approach. It's funny saying over and over again, you know, next game we're going to, you know, let's go even harder. You know, if we get stuck a little bit, if we feel like we're not sure what to do, you know, just go harder, take the positive option with everything that we do. And, you know, it, it's not always going to work, but, you know, if you're looking to be positive and, and stuff like that, it just makes everything a lot easier, you know, whether you, you know, want to go out and play freely or you want to make some crucial, decisive decisions at the crease, especially with the bat. Um, you know, I remember another knock that's probably going to be forgotten. Um, was Zach, I think he got 30, like mid 30s to 40 in, um, at Old Trafford against a reverse swinging ball. And, you know, 30s in a test match sometimes, well, doesn't really get noticed, but I thought his decision making throughout that whole innings was incredible against Rabada and Nokia with, you know, bowling night mile now reverse swing ball. But again, he, was, he, he felt like he was always trying to be positive with his movements, with his decision making, which he actually said. You know, I felt a million dollars, even though he didn't get the runs that he wanted, but, um, you know, he still felt great out in the middle. And then, and then yeah, we just sort of, I don't know, everything we, we set out to do after that game at Lords, you know, showed us where we were really at as a team, because obviously we managed to win the um, next two games and take the series. Anyway, 126 for one, four to win. Janssen's on his way, cruising in, left arm over the wicket, and bowls to Crawley, who leans back and hits it for four through the covers. And England have won their sixth test match of the summer, the first time that has happened since 2004. They've won this by nine wickets. And who on earth would have predicted that amongst the wreckage of the winter? To turn things around as they have is really remarkable. They've beaten the world test champions. They've beaten India in that one-off game. And now they've beaten the team that is the current leader, of the world test championship. And they've won this series 2-1. And then on to Pakistan and questions over whether you can take this approach to Pakistani flat pitches. And you had the first test in Royal Pindi, and it shows that you absolutely can and will. <laughs> I think that I think the um, the question will it work against every opposition will probably keep being asked until we play against every opposition. Um, because that sort of that seemed to be the trick of the summer was our uh, yeah you can't do this against New Zealand it worked you can't do this against South Africa you know it worked and we won the series and oh you can't do this against the Indian attack they're too good you know it worked again and then same again in Pakistan you know with the pitches and everything like that you know is it going to work you know no you have to be patient you have to like stick in and play for the long haul but that's not how we wanted to operate when we came out here um, yes completely different conditions and you know just you sort of have to think completely differently because of the wickets and stuff like that, but still just playing with the same mindset, just slightly differently because, you know, adjusting to the, to the conditions, but still 
focusing on what the goal is, which is to, to give yourself the best opportunity to, to win a test match. And obviously the first game was was one of those times where it was, you know, like, right, just, I don't know, just sort of dangle a little carrot to Pakistan and say, you know, here you go, the game's, the game's there for you, but, you know, are you good enough to, to come and do it against us with the way in which we're, we want to operate on the test match? And England have won this match in the most thrilling of circumstances. The sun is just dipping behind the water tank of that concrete building to our right. There may have been another 10, 15 minutes or so of time. England have gambled, they've been positive, they threw the gauntlet down and they have won this match by 74 runs on the blandest, flattest pitch you could find. It's briefly away from the Test cricket. You played in the T20 World Cup. You hit the winning runs. <laughs> and now all England's players come rushing onto the ground as well. That's a famous win. And they're mobbing Ben Stokes, who has taken England home here this evening. But it's that man, Stokes, who's kept the calm, cool head when it really mattered, who's finished with 52 not out. And he's made sure that England won here with an over to spare and uh, by five wickets. Not playing in, in the World Cup's amazing, whatever game you play in, but, you know, getting to the MCG and, and knowing you're going to walk out and, and play in the final was, was awesome. Um, and knowing that the MCG was going to be full of you know, 96,000 people and we knew that uh, Pakistan were going to be heavily supported so we knew the atmosphere there was going to be amazing. Um, and yeah, it was obviously like a, a low scoring game but sometimes those low scoring games are, are amazing to watch and you know, obviously when it got deeper and deeper in our innings and it was getting sort of tighter and tighter and didn't really know which way it was going to go but yeah, it was amazing to be there at the end and, and see the lads home and to be lifting the, the trophy at the end there after... Because, you know, five weeks in, in a tournament like that to, to walk away saying that, you know, you've gone all the way and World Cup champions is, is incredible. And I've not left Australia too many times with fond memories of playing cricket there, so there's one, there's one good memory that I can take away from Australia um, winning the T20 World Cup out there. You think of this Headingley and World Cup World Cup finals, you seem, there's something in you that just seems to relish the big moment. Is that fair? <laughs> I don't know, I think it's just luck, maybe. Just be there, be there at the right time, I guess. Um, but, yeah, I don't know, I think just, I think every time I go out and, you know, play and represent this, this country, it, it's a huge honour and, you know, just because it doesn't mean that any situation or any given time is more important than the other. Um, you know, I guess, I don't know, maybe just when you know what's on the line, I don't know, maybe just, not switches you on a bit more, but just when you know what's at stake, I think maybe just gives you a little bit more, you know, that tunnel vision as to, to what you know what's on the line.